Hello, everyone. Welcome to this session on Databricks Lakehouse Overview, and thank you for joining us today. My name's Dave, and I'll be your instructor today. I work on the curriculum development team. Outside of work, I enjoy riding my bicycle and reading technical manuals. Uh, you might call me a geek, and I'm okay with that. Along with me today, we have fantastic TAs who are going to help us out. They'll be answering your questions in the chat. Hello, and a big thank you to all of our TAs. Let's go ahead and talk a little bit about this session. This course was developed for those of you who are new to the big data and AI space. Perhaps you're in a more traditional business management role where you are helping move your organization to the cloud. Perhaps you oversee a data science team and your primary role is to make sure business needs are met, but you don't have a technical background yourself. Or perhaps you're looking to change careers and you're brand new to this space and you wanna know more about big data and AI. If any of these sound like you or similar to you, this is a great course for you to take. Our hope is that you walk away from this session feeling comfortable to have discussions about and come to decisions about how to best position your organization to make the most out of your data. In this course, we'll start with the basics. In the first half of the course, we're going to take a step back from Databricks and introduce you to concepts like data types, data formats, the key roles and abilities to look for when building data teams, and the different ways that organizations today are working with big data. So for example, what is machine learning? How does that differ from deep learning? We'll spend a good time talking about data management systems looking at the pros and cons of data warehouses, data lakes, and lake houses. We'll talk about the issues that organizations face when it comes to big data and AI. Finally, in the second half of the course, we'll review how the Databricks Lakehouse platform fits in an organization's big data architecture. What it is, what it does, and how Databricks customers are using the Lakehouse platform to streamline their workflows and make the most of their data. An important note here, and again, just want to make sure that everyone's in the right place. Everything we cover in this presentation will be from a business or operational perspective. We won't be showing any code in this course, nor will we have any hands on labs in this course. We'll also not be showcasing Databricks functionality in notebooks or any Databricks service. All right, we're ready to go. So if you're still here, thanks for joining us and let's get started. Here's our agenda for today. If you have questions about anything I present, please use the chat to ask any questions. For some of you, this might be your first session. So let's make sure you know how to use the chat. Please go ahead and let us know where you are joining us from today. Type it in the chat. While you do that, I'll let you know that I'm joining you from beautiful Southern Utah in the United States. Good to meet all of you and thanks for being here. Next, please let us know what industry your organization belongs to. Go ahead and type that in the chat. Next, if you know, what is the total volume of data your organization manages today? Type that in the chat. And one more question, what do you aim to learn during this session? Let's go ahead and get started with the session. Part one, the big data landscape. We're gonna start by talking about big data benefits for business. I wanna talk about this question first. How well do you know this customer? He's male, 35 years old, single, resides in New York City, and makes $100,000 per year. What do you think would happen if the bank accidentally transferred $5,000 into his account? Do you think he would A, give the money back, or B, take the money and run? Think about this. If anyone feels particularly excited about either of these answers, go ahead and put it in the chat and tell us why. Why do you think that he would either give the money back or run? I'm sure that some of you are thinking, we can't really know, can we? There's too many unknowns. 
What if we had more data? Let me give you a little bit more information. What if I now told you that this individual is Darth Vader? Yes, Darth Vader packed up the Death Star and moved to New York. How would knowing this change your assessment of what would happen to the money? Just in case some of you on the call have never heard of Darth Vader, he's on average a pretty bad guy. He probably wouldn't care about the legalities of keeping money that isn't his. How did knowing this change your original answer? Or did it? Knowing more information about our customer allowed us to really increase the certainty on what decisions they will make in a given situation. Now, think about this example on a much larger and complex scale. That is why big data and AI are becoming very important tools for organizations today. For one person, we can reason it out. Scale that to millions of customers, though, and that manual approach just doesn't work. When we think about unlocking the full potential of our big data, this is what's so powerful. Imagine if we knew all our customers that well. This was just an example with customer relations, but if your organization can successfully tap into your big data and extract insights from it, you end up with a significant advantage over your competitors. Using big data to determine what customers will do, those insights help you make better business decisions. As we'll discuss further, big data is the new norm when it comes to data. If your organization's not currently prepared to successfully process big data, or if you're struggling, it's important to find solutions that can help you. Databricks is one of those solutions that we'll talk about in the second half of the course today. Let's take a look at these statistics. Today, 83% of CEOs say AI is a strategic priority for their organization today. Then we can take a look at this quote. Gardner predicts the business value created by AI will reach $3.9 trillion in 2022. Gartner also says that through 2022, 85% of AI projects will deliver erroneous outcomes due to bias in data, algorithms, or the teams responsible for managing them. That doesn't sound good at all. When you combine big data and analytics, you can answer questions to help you get to know your customers better, improve your products, protect your business, and stay ahead of the competition. Questions like, how are your customers actually using your product? How are your products performing? Is our data secure? And are we keeping up with industry trends? We list several questions on this slide, and I'm sure you can think of others. Even though this has been kept at a high level so far, these types of questions are relevant across every industry. I'm just going to give you one example from each of the industries shown on this slide. Actual use cases on Databricks, but this is in no way an exhaustive list. In retail and CPG, someone might be looking to utilize AI for demand forecasting to predict real-time demand in retail stores. In media and entertainment, streaming platforms might look to use their data to predict which customers are at greatest risk for churn and proactively take steps to prevent this, like improving personalized recommendations. In health and life sciences, research organizations might want to combine large real-world data sets with genomic data to identify biomarkers that have high probability of driving the onset of disease. In financial services, companies might look to detect and prevent fraudulent activities, for example, money laundering or credit card fraud, by leveraging techniques like machine learning. This is because you can predict anomalies in real time. There are very different use cases, but all are made possible when using the right tools on your big data. Before we continue talking about big data, we probably need to define what it is. But first, think about how much data has changed over this past 20 years. And either in your head or in the chat, try to answer these questions. How has data changed over time? How has that affected what we can do with it? How has that affected how we manage it? 
Again, please type answers into the chat if you're so inclined. Over the last 20 years, advances in technology have completely changed the world we live in. Today, the amount of data being generated every second has increased dramatically due to the invention of new sources of data that just didn't exist before. Almost everything we do generates data. Take a moment to think about the things you've done today. Did you text someone or post something on social media? Did you exercise and log your workout using a fitness tracker? Did you use your smartphone to browse the internet, pay bills, or go shopping? At a minimum, you logged in to take this course. As you did all of these things with the machines and tools you used to do them, they generated data. We think of data as being human-generated, machine-generated, and organization-generated. Human-generated data is data that humans create and share, things like social media posts. Social media has been a leading force in the propagation of human-generated data. Just think, every time we post a message, change our online statuses, upload images, or like and forward comments, we are generating data. We also have things like emails and spreadsheets, presentations, audio files, video files. Machine-generated data is data generated from machines that doesn't rely on active human intervention. Machine-generated data can be sensors on vehicles, appliances and industrial machinery, security cameras, satellites, medical devices, personal tools such as smartphone apps, fitness trackers. What does it mean for data to be generated without active human intervention? Think of a fitness tracker. Depending on the model you have, it might generate records for your heart rate, your geographic location, calories you burn, and more. You don't tell your fitness tracker to track these things. It comes programmed to do it and does it on its own. Organization-generated data is data generated as organizations run their businesses. What are some examples of organization-generated data? Well, records generated every time you make a purchase or at an online or physical store. Things like unique customer numbers, items you purchased, the date and time you purchased items, and how many of each item you purchased. Organization-generated data is often referred to as transactional data. You'll hear this term frequently in the world of big data. It's important to note that although all these sources are constantly generating data, not all of the data generated is necessarily considered big data. Think of yourself sending text messages throughout the day, for example. The collection of your daily text messages is probably not considered big data, unless you're sending millions of them, I guess. You might be asking yourself, when is data considered to be big? We'll review characteristics of big data in this next lesson. We'll start off by talking about the characteristics that distinguish big data from just plain data. It's important to note that these characteristics are what make it very difficult to work with big data and why equipping your teams to do that work is not an easy task. The term big data refers to data that is nearly impossible to process using traditional methods because there's just so much of it coming in so quickly and in many different formats. We, we can summarize these major characteristics used to define big data as volume, velocity, and variety. Let's start with volume. Volume refers to the incredible amount of data being generated every second of every day. The International Data Corporation, or IDC, which is a global provider of market intelligence and advisory services in the IT space, forecasts that the amount of data that exists in the world will grow from 33 zettabytes in 2018 to 177 zettabytes by 2025. Just to put that into perspective, the computer I'm on right now has 500 gigabytes of storage. That's equivalent to just 0 .0000000, and a lot of zeros, zettabytes. 33 zettabytes seems like an impossible number, but think about how much data each and every one of us generates every single day through social media, cell phones, personal fitness trackers, etc. If we look at this from a business perspective, it's great. 
we have so much more data coming in that we can use. However, how are you going to store that data? How are you going to capture that data? The second characteristic that defines big data is velocity, which refers to the speed at which new data is generated and the speed at which data moves around. According to the IDC, in 2025, each connected person will have at least one data interaction every 18 seconds. That's about 6 billion people. Even now, think about the speed at which credit card transactions are checked for fraudulent activities. I know that it's happened to me that I buy something out of the ordinary and all of a sudden my credit card company reaches out to me within seconds to ask me if that was me. Sometimes it's so quick that they block the transaction right there until I verify that it was me. It's awkward to have your credit card declined, but I'd prefer that to a stolen identity. From a business perspective, how can you make use of this data coming in so quickly? How can your teams process such enormous amounts of data coming in so quickly and constantly? Finally, when we look at big data, we look at data variety. There are so many different types of data that are being generated today. Social media posts, credit card transactions, biometric data, customer transactions, geographic information, just to name a few. And this makes it incredibly difficult to make sense of it all together. So again, thinking from a business perspective, we ask ourselves, how can I combine all of these disparate types of data and extract useful information from it? Now, I'm curious. If you're willing to share, what would you say is the most unique type of data you've worked with in the past? Perhaps you had challenges combining it with other data? If you'd like to share, please use the chat. Personally, I think it's very interesting what organizations have done today with social media data. Being able to hear directly from people and make the world safer, or perhaps improve customer service at a local restaurant. And what about genomic data? Analyzing human genomes to find treatments for diseases is also really fascinating. All right, we've been talking about different types of data. And as you can imagine, different types of big data have different storage and processing requirements. Having this background of what types of big data look like will help with context when we talk later about the different technologies used to store big data. Big data is usually categorized into the following three categories, structured, semi-structured, and unstructured data. The term structured data refers to any data that conforms to a certain format or schema. Because it is clearly organized, it's generally easier to analyze which is why for a long time we kept our data as structured data. Examples of structured data include a customer database, credit card database, address book, and a product database. By contrast, unstructured data does not follow or fit neatly into a schema. It's often referred to as messy data because it isn't easily searched compared to structured data. Because of that, this data is typically the most difficult to analyze. Of course, it's also the most widespread type of data. IDC reports that almost 90% of data today is unstructured. Because unstructured data is so readily available, it can be really valuable in terms of extracting meaningful insights for your organizations. One of the most powerful aspects of machine learning is that we can use it to help analyze this data. Examples of unstructured data include social media posts, photographs, videos, emails, audio files, video files, and images. Semi-structured data fits in between structured and unstructured data. Semi-structured data does not reside in a formatted table, but it does have some level of organization. A good example of semi-structured data is HTML code. If you've ever right-clicked in your browser and selected Inspect or Inspect Element, you've seen an example of this. Although you're not restricted to how much information you want to collect or what kind of information you want to collect, there is still a defined way to express data. All right, now we've covered the three types of data, structured, unstructured, and semi-structured. Of course, due to the characteristics we just talked about, we can't use traditional methods of computing to handle this data. 
let's take a quick look at how we can process all this data. So we have all these types of data. How do we process this data? Let's take a look at distributed processing next. You might have had a situation as a kid where you and your classmates were asked to guess how many pieces of candy were in a jar. The person who guessed the correct number got to take the whole jar of candy home and eat it for days. Now imagine this. What if I gave you and a group of your colleagues an entire tub of candies and told you that whoever finished counting the candies first wins a prize? The caveat is that the count had to be accurate for you to win. What would you do? Post in the chat. This time, I want you to really think about this and please write an answer in the chat. Again, I'll give you a few seconds. You might line the candies up and count them one by one. While this would eventually give you an accurate count, it would take a really, really long time. What about weighing the candy? You could weigh one candy, weigh the entire tub of candy, and figure out how many pieces of candy there are. While this would give you a count relatively quickly, what if there were different types of candy in the jar? Then you can't guarantee that all the candy weighs the same, so you might not have an accurate count. Let's look at this from a different viewpoint. Let's bring in our colleagues. What if we split up the entire tub of candy between our colleagues? We can distribute the candies among them so that instead of us having to do the whole count on our own, our colleagues are all counting the candies at the same time, helping us get through the tub of candy much faster. This is the idea behind distributed computing. We divide the data into smaller chunks and distribute it among workers, which are just different computers. We can then perform whatever our computation is in this case, it's a count, in parallel on the smaller subsets of data. Distributed computing is what makes it possible to process big data. For those of you who have heard of Apache Spark before, it is the de facto standard when it comes to distributed computing tools used for big data processing and analytics. The founders of Databricks are actually the people who invented Spark and for years, Spark has been the core engine underlying Databricks. When we think in terms of big data processing, there are two types of data that we process, batch and streaming data. These terms, batch and streaming, refer to the way we're getting our data and the speed at which we're getting our data. What is it? Batch data is data that we have in storage and that we process all at once or in a batch. A real-world example of batch processing is how telecommunication companies process cellular phone usage each month to generate our monthly phone bills. To do this, they process batch data, the phone calls you've made, text messages you've sent, and any additional charges you've incurred through that billing cycle to generate your bill. They process that batch data in a batch job. On the other hand, we have streaming data. Streaming data is data that is being continually produced by one or more sources and therefore must be processed incrementally as it arrives. Now, what if instead of counting candy sitting in a jar, we are asked to count candy coming towards us on a conveyor belt? As the candy reaches us, we have to count the new pieces and constantly update our overall candy count. In a streaming job, our final count is changing in real time as more and more candy arrives on the conveyor belt. A real world example of stream processing is how heart monitors work. All day long, as you wear your heart monitor, it receives new data, dozens of thousands of data points per day as your heart beats. Every time your heart beats, new data is added to your heart monitor in real time. If your heart monitor has a display of your average heartbeat for the day, that average must be constantly updated with the new numbers from the incoming stream of data. Both batch and streaming data have their place when it comes to big data analytics. Batch data is used for things like periodic reporting, and streaming data is used for things like fraud detection, which needs to be identified in real time. Historically, it's been difficult to use these different types of data in conjunction. 
Thanks to new advances in technology, however, combining batch and stream processing is possible and leads to significant advantages in big data analytics. All right, now we'll take a 15 minute break.
All right, we're now to part two. In part two, we're going to talk about some important big data concepts and how these concepts fit into your organization. We'll start off with some terms that are thrown around a lot, sometimes interchangeably. To start, let's review the relationship between artificial intelligence, or AI, machine learning, and deep learning as these terms are often used interchangeably, but mean slightly different things. What is artificial intelligence? In essence, artificial intelligence is a branch of computer science in which computer systems are developed to perform tasks that would typically need human intelligence. AI is a broad field, and there are a lot of subcategories. We'll talk about two of them right now, machine learning and deep learning. Machine learning is a subset of artificial intelligence. The goal of machine learning is to learn patterns in your data without explicitly programming them in. There are a few types of machine learning. The most commonly used type is supervised machine learning in which you are given a set of data with the correct results already labeled. Your goal is to predict the labels or outcomes of new data of the same format. Let's go into greater depth for the fraud detection example. Without machine learning, people would manually specify rules for what constitutes fraud, like the number of transactions per month greater than 20 and an average balance of less than $100. But these rules are brittle they're prone to human error, and they can quickly go stale. With machine learning, however, you can create an algorithm with an input data set that contains transaction information that has already been labeled as either fraud or not fraud. After the algorithm is created on this data, you can pass in new transaction data that has not been labeled fraud or not fraud, and the algorithm will predict if the data is fraudulent. This can be extended for millions and millions of transactions. This is the power of applying machine learning to big data. Now let's see how deep learning fits into the bigger ecosystem of machine learning. While our supervised learning example is very good with tabular or structured data, such as that in a table or Excel spreadsheet, deep learning performs well on complex data sets like images, sequences, and natural language. So what is deep learning? Deep learning is a subset of machine learning that uses something called neural networks, which were inspired by the structure of the human brain. They are much more complex than most machine learning models and require significantly more time and effort to build. Unlike ML, which plateaus after a certain amount of data, DL continues to improve as the data size increases. Deep learning is expanding into more and more domains, such as generating movie scripts, predicting cancer based on MRI scans better than human radiologists, or making anyone feel like Van Gogh with style transfer. Now, where does data science fit into all of this? Data science is a field that combines tools and workflows from disciplines like math and statistics, computer science and business to process, manage, and analyze data. Data science is very popular in businesses today as a way to extract insights from big data to help inform business decisions. So how is data science related to the techniques we've already talked about? Machine learning and deep learning are common tools in a data scientist's toolbox to help extract insights from data. While this was not an exhaustive list, these are some of the most popular techniques for working with big data. An important idea to note here is that one of the benefits of using these techniques, particularly machine learning and deep learning, is that they help scale analytics. As you can imagine, once machines learn how to detect patterns in our data, they are able to make predictions much faster than humans can. As we've discussed, all of these techniques are used by data science practitioners to help extract insights from big data. They use these techniques as part of the data science workflow, a series of steps they follow to process, manage, and analyze data. In our next lesson, we'll talk more about the data science workflow. Now that we've established the difference between AI, ML, and DL, and data science, let's talk about what your data teams are doing or can do 
with these frameworks. We'll start with the workflow your teams are following as they work with data and talk about the specific roles on data science teams. First though, why are we going into this? When it comes time to make a decision as to what technology or set of technologies you need to equip your teams, or when it comes to creating a big organizational data strategy, it's really important to understand what each member of your team does. After all, ultimately, your choices will affect how they work. I know this is probably true of a lot of people here, but how many of you have had this experience? Your manager purchases tools to help you do your work more efficiently. They purchase these tools sometimes with very little communication with you. When you start using the tool, you realize that it doesn't help you with all of your daily needs at all. Now you're left scrambling with how to make up for workflows that the new tool doesn't cover. And what's more, if it isn't compatible with tools you already use regularly, you have an even bigger problem. The individuals on data science teams typically work with data using a cyclical workflow known as the data science workflow. Here are the stages. Identifying business needs, ingesting data, preparing data, analyzing data, and sharing data insights. Let's talk through each stage and why it's needed. First, let's talk about identifying business needs. In this step, business leaders or managers usually come up with a list of questions they want answered. Questions like, should we make changes to our product? Which of our customers are at the greatest risk for churn and why? Or can we save money by changing the way we're pricing our products? In this phase of the data science workflow, business leaders identify a set of questions or business goals for data practitioners to solve and work towards. In the data ingestion phase, your organization is taking data in. Often there is a combination of different types of data. You might have real-time data, which comes in streams, such as customer transactions that get added to your data store every time a customer purchases something, or the continuous data from a heart rate monitor or fitness tracker. Other times, data is ingested in batches. An example of ingesting batch data could be loading customer records into your data store that exist in spreadsheets somewhere else, on a local drive perhaps. At this stage, data is in its raw and often messy state. After your organization ingests this raw data, it needs to be prepared for use through a data cleaning and preparation process referred to as data munging. Munging data can mean anything like cleaning up, extracting, standardizing, joining, consolidating, or filtering data. The point is to prepare the data enough so that people using it to train machine learning models or generate business visualizations don't have to fix their input data. During data analysis, your data teams are exploring this prepared data to find data insights. Oftentimes, this is where machine learning comes into play. Although machine learning isn't the only type of data analysis that can be applied to your data, it is becoming more and more popular today, especially in conjunction with big data. Aside from machine learning, individuals can also query data or produce visualizations. Finally, once business insights are discovered, they are shared with you or other stakeholders who use them to make business decisions. This could be through interactive dashboards or emails, presentations, or more. At a high level, this is what your data science teams are doing. Now let's take a closer look at the individuals doing these things. Who's responsible for what? We covered the high level workflow of how data starts from its originating source moves through a workflow and ends up in something like a dashboard for you to review. Now let's go into a little bit more detail and think about what a data science team typically looks like as they go through these steps. As we go through this section, think to yourself, does my team look like this? As a side note, especially in smaller companies, I've seen situations where one person is fulfilling all of these roles. However, these are highly specialized roles and as businesses grow, they trend towards breaking out these roles into a variety of skill sets. Some organizations break roles out even further, but for the sake of this session, we'll be using this terminology as umbrella terms. Let's start with data engineers. 
Data engineers develop, construct, test, and maintain data pipelines, which take data from its raw data source and move it along that pipeline to where it can be used at different stages of a machine learning or data analytics project. Data engineers are the first line of defense. They take that raw, messy data and perform data munging. To perform their duties, data engineers use a set of tools to build and maintain these pipelines, including programming languages like Python and Scala, different data storage solutions like Delta Lake, data processing engines like Apache Spark. Data scientists, on the other hand, take the data prepared by data engineers and use a variety of methods to perform analytics. Data scientists usually have a strong background in disciplines like math, statistics, and computer science. They are often tasked with building machine learning models, testing those models, and keeping track of their machine learning experiments. To perform their duties, data scientists use tools like programming languages like Python, R, and SQL, machine learning libraries, and notebook interfaces like Jupyter. Now, data analysts also take data prepared by data engineers to extract insights. Typically, a data analyst will also present data in the form of graphs, charts, and dashboards to stakeholders to help them make business decisions. Data analysts can also take advantage of the work of machine learning engineers to help derive insights from the data. They're typically well-versed in data visualization tools and business intelligence concepts and can be in charge of interpreting data insights and effectively communicating their findings with stakeholders. To perform their duties, data analysts often use the SQL programming language and visualization and dashboarding tools like Tableau, Power BI, Looker, and others. All right, platform administrators can also be called DevOps engineers, infrastructure engineers, and cloud engineers. They're responsible for managing and supporting big data infrastructure. This could include things like setting up big data infrastructure, updating, maintaining, and performing health checks on that infrastructure, and providing governance to data science team members around changes or upgrades. To perform their duties, platform administrators often use tools like the various infrastructure and monitoring services the major cloud providers offer to help them keep data secure and scale and manage their infrastructure. All right, now we'll take a 15 minute break.
All right, let's talk about the challenges of working with big data. This is an important section because it helps set the stage for why Databricks was built in the first place. Let's kick off this section with a question. Please answer this in the chat. Think about the organizational challenges you've seen when organizations work with big data. It could be your current organization, previous organization you work for, or another organization you're aware of. What are challenges you've seen organizations face when trying to work with big data? Think about it and drop your answer in the chat. As you think about it, I can give you some ideas. Maybe you've seen that even though your team members know what they're doing, there just isn't enough of them to scale. Or there are so many tools that we can use, we don't know where to start. In the early days of data analytics, simple relational databases, historical data, and spreadsheet expertise were used to drive business decisions. Today, with the emergence of big data, these methods just are no longer sufficient. Businesses today spend a significant amount of resources trying to piece together solutions for extracting insights from big data. Most organizations, close to 90%, fail on big data and analytics projects despite spending these resources. Why is extracting insights from big data so complicated? In this lesson, we'll explore just that. Challenge number one, working with big data is just not easy. Big data is hard to manage. It's coming in massive volumes faster than ever before and in a wide variety of formats. As data practitioners work to design their organization's big data infrastructure, they often ask and need to answer questions like, where and how will we store our big data? How can we process batch and stream data? How can we use different types of data together in our analyses? like unstructured versus structured data? How can we keep track of all the work we're doing on our big data? As you can imagine, there are many ways that an organization can set up big data infrastructure. Getting it right is the hard part. What frequently ends up happening is that organizations set up different technology stacks to handle their data workloads. Often these technology stacks don't work well together due to many different tools introduced that are not compatible or not easily compatible with each other. Proprietary data formats that are not easy to translate from one tool to another. If you want to enable advanced use cases, you have to move across these stacks. Think about the work your organization does. You don't typically have a data warehouse use case or a streaming use case you most likely have a supply chain logistics use case or a financial risk assessment use case. To address these challenges, you need to move across these technology stacks. With multiple stacks set up, many organizations suffer from the challenges of having siloed functional roles for individuals on their data science teams. For example, it's not uncommon for a data scientist to build and train a machine learning model in a vacuum on their computer with little to no visibility to related work being done by, for example, the data engineer who's preparing the data for them or the data analyst who might be using results from their experiments to produce dashboards. This leads to communication slowdowns and teams working with different versions of the same data. This affects data security and governance and ultimately results in less productive data teams. Speaking of data security, according to Gartner, 80% of organizations will fail to develop a consolidated data security policy. This leaves them and their data vulnerable to security breaches. Think about the ramifications of a security breach. Beyond just the immediate monetary cost, there is a long lasting loss in customer trust and company reputation. If you've ever been a customer of a company that has suffered a security breach, you know firsthand how long it can take to rebuild trust. Besides protecting data from leaking out, organizations must ensure they're compliant with data protection regulations like the GDPR, the European Union's General Data Protection Regulation, and HIPAA, the Health Insurance Portability and Accountability Act. Plus, they must have the required certifications to run their businesses. 
there are often hefty penalties if they're not compliant. One of the biggest issues that organizations face is the difficulty in collecting and storing data. With data volumes increasing, data becoming more distributed, and data types changing, setting up and maintaining big data infrastructure to manage this data is incredibly complex. That's why today many organizations are struggling with their data storage systems, especially figuring out which technology is right for them and where to migrate their data. Today, we're going to take a look at data warehouses, data lakes, and lake houses, which is the way Databricks looks at the world. We'll get to why in just a few slides. Let's first talk about data warehouses. Data warehouses have been powering business intelligence, or BI, decisions for around 30 years. If you work for a data-driven organization, it is highly likely that a data warehouse currently helps to power your company's decision-making. They evolved as a set of guidelines to design systems controlling the flow of data used in decision-making. In many companies, data warehouses delivered immediate benefits by reducing duplicate data in isolated data marts. These data marts had been developed for use by a single department within the company and contained highly specific views of data used to generate reports and guide business decisions. The problem was that many departments need similar views of the data, and as such, large companies might have dozens of data marts with almost identical data, but with different naming conventions and update frequencies. These redundancies led to high costs for storage, development, and maintenance, as well as confusion when trying to refer to data that wasn't managed by a central set of rules. The data contained in data warehouses comes from a variety of sources, generally referred to as operational data. Operational data can be anything that drives the functioning of a company. This includes data from point of sale or POS systems, customer relationship management or CRM systems, and inventory management systems. By combining data from diverse sources into common tables, analytic insights can be used to drive decision making. While glancing through a database or spreadsheet can provide a quick glimpse into the behavior of a given account, data warehouses provide the ability to drill down and see seasonal trends in how a subset of products have performed with an enterprise customer in various regions. Data warehouses are designed to optimize these queries, prevent conflicts between concurrently running queries, and make the assumption that the data entered is unlikely to change with high frequency. As such, when aggregating results over millions of records, the data warehouses can safely assume that those records won't change while they're being accessed. In order to keep operations running smoothly, data warehouses efficiently collect data from these various systems in a process called Extract, Transform, and Load, or ETL, or sometimes ELT for Extract, Load, and Transform. A team of data engineers and database administrators define how the data will be processed and stored, and the end BI analysts can count on their data to be cleaned, validated, and updated on a consistent basis. Keeping these ETL workloads running is vitally important to business operations, and delays or errors in these processes can lead to erroneous reports and delays in business metrics. Because data warehouses originally were developed using on-premises technology to drive BI decisions, they've had some pain points in adapting to the modern data atmosphere. The proliferation of smart devices and web-based commerce has increased both the volume and the variety of data. Data warehouses traditionally rely on proprietary data formats, which do not support video, image, or free text files. Traditional data warehouse technologies forced customers to invest in enough compute power and storage to handle their peak user traffic. With the exponential growth many companies have seen in their data in recent years, this design can become extremely expensive. Cloud-based data warehouses have addressed some of these challenges. Because of the flexibility of the cloud, it's always possible to scale up the amount of computing power or data storage needed. 
That being said, many data warehouses continue to use compute attached storage, meaning that scaling down the size of your compute and storage can be difficult. In short, while the move to the cloud eliminates the need to buy and maintain the right number of physical servers, you may find your recurrent cloud costs exponentially growing alongside your data. Another big pain point for data warehouses is that they don't have native support for machine learning or ML applications. The databases and tables used in data warehouses aren't well suited to working with unstructured data, like user comments and images. And data warehouse vendors generally don't allow outside applications to directly access their proprietary data formats. While SQL queries for BI usually look at a small subset of data, ML algorithms need access to huge amounts of data. Neither the way the data is stored nor the query engine is optimized to return the data needed by data scientists. And the open source technology that powers most ML applications can't communicate natively with proprietary data warehouses. So let's move away from data warehouses and let's start talking about data lakes and how they've evolved to address some of these issues. Data lakes have only come into widespread use over the last decade, driven by huge increases in the variety and volume of data and powered by technological advances to store and process data cheaply and efficiently. Data lakes have often been defined in opposition to data warehouses. While a data warehouse delivers clean, structured data for BI analytics, a data lake allows an organization to permanently and cheaply store data of any nature in any format. In short, while a data warehouse requires knowledge of which data will be used how before engineering begins, Decisions on how to use data in a data lake can be delayed by months or even years and then uncovered through data mining. Data mining is the process of analyzing large amounts of historical data to uncover patterns and anomalies that may have predictive power and is a core building block of many successful ML applications. Data lakes originally evolved as an on-premise technology closely tied to the Apache Hadoop ecosystem. Many early internet companies had been amassing huge amounts of data and were seeking solutions to process and monetize it. The Hadoop Distributed File System, or HDFS, allowed engineers to start working with data distributed across dozens or hundreds of servers as if it were part of the same machine. While this physical infrastructure was expensive to purchase, maintain, and operate, the abilities unlocked by the design allowed companies like Facebook, Netflix, and Yahoo to create and power new data-driven applications. While many companies continue to run HDFS data lakes on premises, most companies have transitioned to working in the cloud. Each of the cloud vendors offer their own take on object storage, which is particularly well suited for use as a data lake for a number of reasons. The first is that object storage doesn't rely on the same relationship between compute and storage seen in a traditional file system. Data lakes have the benefit of supporting any kind of data, regardless of the structure or format. Much of the benefit of data lakes comes from support for semi-structured data. Data falling into this category includes comma-separated value or CSV files, spreadsheets, and the JSON data format commonly used by web applications. These files are called semi-structured because they have a relationship between rows and columns, but this relationship is not rigid. On the other hand, data warehouses typically are only designed to work with structured data, which enforces relationships between tables and databases and brings a level of certainty in the quality of the data. Data lakes allow both structured and semi-structured data to be stored alongside unstructured data like video, images, free text, and log files. This gives companies a single location to store all their meaningful data. Because data storage and compute are not coupled in a data lake design, a number of technologies have evolved around working with data stored in data lakes. Apache Spark originally evolved as part of the Hadoop ecosystem, running against data stored on HDFS. 
as the compute engine used by Databricks, this technology has grown substantially to be a market leader in running analytic queries, ETL, and ML workloads over huge quantities of data stored in data lakes. Spark applications process data of all kinds and power some of the world's largest data-intensive applications and data-driven decisions. So while many companies will choose to use both a data lake and a data warehouse in their architecture, it's important to understand the strengths and weaknesses of each. First, let's summarize what we talked about with data warehouses. Data warehouses are good because people are used to working with them. They're reliable and they provide fast reads and writes of data. The weaknesses are related to scalability, structured data limitations, lock into vendors and their formats, and cost. And data lakes are flexible in the types and amounts of data they can hold, they're easy to scale, and they enable ML workloads. But because of their lack of reliability and their complexity, they can be difficult to navigate. They're also not optimized for queries in the same way that certain data warehouses are. At Databricks, we approach this problem with a different perspective. While data warehouse companies seek to add new functionality and features to keep you locked into their proprietary format, we developed a new open source standard to add transactional processing guarantees and performance benefits into the data lake. This is what the lake house is all about. All right, now we'll take a 15 minute break.
In the next section, we'll pivot and start talking about the Databricks Lakehouse platform and how Databricks works within organizations on these challenges. Databricks is known as the data and AI company. It's a software as a service company that makes big data and AI easier for organizations to manage, enabling data-driven innovation in all enterprises. To put it simply, the Databricks Lakehouse platform empowers everyone on a data science team to work together in one secure platform from the minute data is ingested into an organization through when it's cleaned up, analyzed, and used to inform business decisions. The Databricks Lakehouse platform enables organizations to ingest, process, and transform massive quantities and types of data, explore data through data science techniques, including, but not limited to, machine learning, guarantee that data available for business queries is reliable and up-to-date, provide data engineers, data scientists, and data analysts the unique tools they need to do their work, and overcome traditional challenges associated with data science and machine learning workflows, which we will explore later in detail in the next lesson. Primarily, data practitioners access Databricks functionality using a custom-built web-based interface. The Databricks web application delivers three different services catering to the specific needs of various persona. Databricks SQL provides a simple experience for users who want to run quick ad hoc SQL queries on their data lake, visualize query results, and create and share dashboards. Databricks Data Science and Engineering Workspace is an environment for accessing Databricks assets, including notebooks, libraries, experiments, and dashboards, as well as the computational resources you need to process data. Databricks Machine Learning is an integrated end-to-end -end machine learning environment for tracking experiments, training models, managing feature development, and serving features and models. We'll explore each individual service in a later section. While you might be using different tools and functionality within Databricks Workspace, depending on your role, everyone is working in one platform. We'll talk more about the characteristics of the Lakehouse architecture later in the course. For now, we can say that a simple, unified system is one of the core concepts that defines a Lakehouse, and this is part of what makes Databricks the Lakehouse platform. Another core Lakehouse concept that we'll dig into is that the data in a Lakehouse should be in open format so that your data belongs to you, always. Databricks has shown a demonstrated commitment to open source technologies. Databricks invented some of the most successful open source projects in the world, as shown in this image, and continues to contribute to these projects regularly. When your organization uses Databricks, you get managed access to open source data projects through the platform, which makes it straightforward for you to use them. Plus, you are unifying your big data system with open source standards. By aligning to open source standards, you establish building blocks to help make your applications more interoperable with different systems. Currently, Databricks works with over 5,000 customers across the globe and with enterprises in every industry, healthcare and life sciences, media and entertainment, financial services, retail, and more. At the end of this course, we'll give you the chance to explore customer use cases in greater depth. However, it will help you to start thinking about what you can do with the platform. In addition to access to the Databricks Lakehouse platform, Databricks customers also get over 450 partners to help you unify your data sources and analytic services and centralized governance. Support from expert services and resources to help enable your users and IT teams to adopt the platform and access to free self-paced training, including a structured sort of work streams and activities that will help you quickly onboard thousands of users while providing the central capabilities to own and run the platform. All right, it's time to move on. At this point, you should have a clear understanding of what Databricks is at a high level. To summarize, Databricks offers a Lakehouse platform accessible via an online login that allows data science teams to collaborate on their work. 
The Lakehouse platform gives customers access to Databricks native tools, managed open source tools, and technical resources to help customers along the way. Now let's talk about the Lakehouse platform. First off, remember when we talked about data lakes and data warehouses? We mentioned that at Databricks, we talk about the Lakehouse. The Lakehouse is at the heart of the Databricks Lakehouse platform. Now there's two ideas to focus on here. There's the lake house and Delta Lake. A data lake house is a new open data management paradigm that combines the most popular capabilities of data lakes and data warehouses. Per their design, they implement similar data structures and data management features to those in a data warehouse, directly on the kind of low cost storage used for data lakes. Merging these ideas into a single system means that data teams can move faster as they can use data without accessing multiple systems. Data lake houses also ensure that teams have the most complete and up-to-date data available for data science, machine learning, and business analytics projects. Data lake houses have the following key features. Transaction support to ensure that multiple parties can concurrently read or write data. Data schema enforcement to ensure data integrity. Rights to a table are rejected if they do not match the table's schema. Governance and auditing mechanisms to make sure you can see how the data is being used. BI support so that BI tools can work directly on source data, which reduces data staleness. Storage decoupled from compute, which means that it's easier for your system to scale to more concurrent users and data sizes. Openness. Storage formats used are open and standard, plus APIs and various other tools make it easy for team members to access data directly. Support for all data types, structured, unstructured, and semi-structured. End-to-end streaming, so that real-time reporting and real-time data can be integrated into data analytics processes just as existing data is. And support for diverse workloads, including data engineering, data science, machine learning, and SQL analytics, all on the same data repository. Now let's define the relationship between Delta Lake on Databricks and a lake house. First off, Delta Lake was developed at Databricks and open sourced in early 2019. Delta Lake on Databricks is the term used for the managed version of Delta Lake that comes with the Databricks lake house platform. For the rest of the course though, we're just gonna call it Delta Lake, but we thought it's important to make that distinction. Delta Lake lays the foundation for the lake house. Remember that a lake house is a data storage paradigm and architecture that combines the most popular functionality of data warehouses and data lakes. By bringing the structure and governance inherent to data warehouses to data lakes with Delta Lake, you create the foundation for a lake house. This image depicts where Delta Lake fits into your Databricks lake house platform. Once data lands in an open data lake, Delta Lake is used to prepare that data for data engineering, business intelligence, SQL analytics, data science, and machine learning use cases. Here are four elements that fall under Delta Lake. Delta Files, Delta Tables, the Delta Optimization Engine, and the Delta Lake Storage Layer. By understanding these elements of Delta Lake, you'll get better insights as to how Delta Lake brings database-like functionality to object stores in a data lake. By design, Delta Lake uses Parquet files to store an organization's data in their object storage. Parquet files are a state-of-the-art file format for keeping tabular data. They are faster and considered more powerful than traditional methods for storing tabular data because they store data using columns instead of rows. When querying, this columnar storage allows you to skip over non-relevant data very quickly. As a result, queries take considerably less time to execute. Delta files leverage all the technical capabilities of Parquet files, but have an additional layer over them. This additional layer tracks data versioning and metadata, stores transaction logs to keep track of changes made to a data table or object store directory, and provides ACID transactions. Now, a Delta table is a collection of data kept using the Delta Lake technology and consists of three things. First, Delta files containing the data and kept in object storage. Second, a Delta table registered in a Metastore, 
where a Metastore is simply a catalog that tracks your data's metadata, or data about your data. And third, the Delta transaction log saved with Delta files in object storage. Delta Engine is a high-performance query engine that provides an efficient way to process data in data lakes. Delta Engine accelerates data lake operations and supports a variety of workloads ranging from large-scale ETL processing to ad hoc interactive queries. Many of these optimizations take place automatically. You get the benefits of these Delta Engine capabilities just by using Databricks for your data lakes. What the Delta Optimization Engine means for your business is that your data workloads run faster so data practitioners can perform their work in less time. When using Delta Lake, your organization stores its data in a Delta Lake storage layer and then accesses that data via Databricks. A key idea here is that an organization keeps all of this data in files in object storage. This is beneficial because it means your data is kept in a lower cost and easily scalable environment. Next, we'll review how Delta Lake guarantees reliable data for an organization. Well, many of these issues are addressed by the way Delta Lake adds ACID transactions to data lakes. ACID stands for atomicity, consistency, isolation, and durability, which are a standard set of guarantees most databases are designed around. Most data lakes have multiple data pipelines that read and write data at the same time. Data engineers often spend a significant amount of time to make sure their data remains reliable during these transactions. With ACID transactions, each transaction is handled as having a distinct beginning and end. This means that data in a table is not updated until a transaction successfully completes, and each transaction will either succeed or fail fully. These transactional guarantees eliminate many of the motivations for having both a data lake and a data warehouse in an architecture. Appending data is easy as each new write will create a new version of a data table and new data won't be read until the transaction completes. This means that data jobs that fail midway can be disregarded entirely. It also simplifies the process of deleting and updating records. Many changes can be applied to the data in a single transaction, eliminating the possibility of incomplete deletes or updates. Delta Lake gives you the ability to specify and enforce your data schema. It automatically validates that the schema of the data being written is compatible with the schema of the table it's being written to. Columns that are present in the table but not in the data are set to null. If there are extra columns in the data that are not present in the table, this operation throws an exception. This ensures that bad data that could corrupt your system is not written into it. Delta Lake also enables you to make changes to a table schema that can be applied automatically. Big data is very large in size, and its metadata, or the information about the files containing the data and the nature of the data, can be very large as well. With Delta Lake, metadata is processed just like regular data, with distributed processing. Delta Lake is designed from the ground up to allow a single system to support both batch and stream processing of data. The transactional guarantees of Delta Lake mean that each micro-batch transaction creates a new version of a table that is instantly available for insights. Many Databricks users use Delta Lake to transform the update frequency of their dashboards and reports from days to minutes while eliminating the need for multiple systems. With Delta Lake, the transaction logs used to ensure ACID compliance create an auditable history of every version of the table, indicating which files have changed between versions. This log makes it easy to retain historical versions of the data to fulfill compliance requirements in various industries, such as GDPR and CCPA. The transaction logs also include metadata, like extended statistics about the files in the table and the data in the files. Databricks uses Spark to scan the transaction logs, applying the same efficient processing to the large amount of metadata associated with millions of files in a data lake. In summary, all of the functionality we have reviewed helps organizations streamline their operations, improve their data pipelines, 
Unify real-time and back data, enabling performing business intelligence workloads on your data lake and meeting regulatory needs. All right, so let's talk about big data workloads with Delta Lake. When data arrives in the Lakehouse platform, it lands into your organization's open data lake. What makes that data lake a lake house is the data management and governance functionality placed on top of that data lake through Delta Lake. With Delta Lake, data engineers can architect pipelines for continuous data flow and refinement using Delta's architectural model shown in this image. It allows data engineers to build pipelines that begin with raw data as a single source of truth from which everything flows. Subsequent transformations and aggregations can be recalculated and validated to ensure that business level aggregate tables are still reflective of the underlying data, even as downstream users refine the data and introduce context specific structure. A Databricks workspace is an environment for accessing all your Databricks assets. The workspace organizes objects like notebooks, libraries, and experiments into folders and provides access to data and computational resources such as clusters and jobs. Databricks also offers powerful version control capabilities with Databricks repos. With Databricks repos, practitioners can easily connect and manage their Git projects that are hosted by large Git providers. This now includes support for files like Markdown, Python, and other text. And all of these workloads can be managed using Databricks Jobs. Jobs provide multitask orchestration support facilitated by an easy-to-use user interface or a more complex API for automated tasks. The combination of repos and jobs enables simple continuous integration and continuous deployment workflows. Databricks SQL is a Databricks service designed with SQL analysts in mind. It provides better price and performance, and it simplifies discovery and sharing of new insights through BI tools with which you are already familiar, like Tableau and Power BI. Finally, Databricks SQL simplifies administration and governance. Databricks SQL also makes it easier for analysts to quickly visualize and share insights with a new and easy to use SQL query editor, rich dashboards, and automatic alerts. In addition to support for your existing BI tools, Databricks SQL offers a full-featured SQL native query editor that allows data analysts to write queries in a familiar syntax and easily explore Delta Lake table schemas. Regularly used SQL code can be saved as snippets for quick reuse, and query results can be cached to keep runtime short. Once queries are built, Databricks SQL also allows analysts to make sense of the results through a wide variety of rich visualizations. The visualizations can be quickly organized at dashboards with an intuitive drag and drop interface. Dashboards can be easily shared with stakeholders both within and outside the organization via a web browser. To keep everyone current, dashboards can be configured to automatically refresh as well as to alert the team to meaningful changes in the data. Traditionally, SQL endpoints have given a quick way to set up SQL and BI-optimized compute. Simply pick the cluster size. Databricks automatically determines appropriate instance types and configuration for the best price and performance. But now, there's also Databricks Serverless SQL. This new capability for Databricks SQL provides instant compute to users for their BI and SQL workloads. With minimal management required and capacity optimizations that can lower overall cost by an average of 40%. Serverless SQL is an active pool of servers automatically patched and upgraded by Databricks that can transfer compute capacity to Databricks SQL users in your organization in about 15 seconds versus minutes. This makes it even easier for organizations to expand adoption of the lake house for business analysts who are looking to access rich, real-time data sets of the lake house with a simple and performant solution. Databricks SQL offers a central log that allows customers to record usage across virtual clusters, users, and time. Customers can also easily observe workloads across Databricks SQL, third-party BI tools, and any other SQL clients. With this information, customers can more easily triage errors and performance issues. 
Now, data science and ML teams use Databricks throughout the entire data science and machine learning life cycles to explore, prepare, and process data, build and test machine learning models, put those models into deployment, and then optimize them. This is done through the Databricks machine learning service. Databricks Machine Learning is the data scientist and machine learning practitioner's access point for the Databricks Lakehouse platform. While there are a variety of places to complete machine learning work, there are a few major reasons for having machine learning practitioners working within the Lakehouse. First, production machine learning depends on code and data. The Databricks ML platform is data native. This means that it sits in the exact same place as your data, so there's no need to move your data from one place to another. And Databricks ML supports easy integration for new and existing machine learning projects with Databricks repos. Two, machine learning requires many different roles to get involved. The Databricks ML platform sits within the larger Databricks platform. This includes environments friendly to data engineering and SQL analysis, so the whole team can get involved in the same platform using the same data. And Databricks ML supports both machine learning development and production workflows, so data scientists and machine learning engineers can work together in the same place. And three, machine learning requires integrating many different components. The Databricks ML platform includes tools to support the entire machine learning workflow, from feature organization to model serving and scoring, the tools in Databricks ML have you covered. And all of these components come packaged in a tested platform and runtime, which makes architecting systems for individual projects easier. Databricks Machine Learning is a data native and collaborative solution for the full ML lifecycle. Whether a data practitioner is exploring or developing features to include in a machine learning model, scaling the training of many models, or deploying a model following a CI-CD process, Databricks Machine Learning is exactly where they need to be. Databricks Machine Learning provides features like AutoML for automated machine learning development, Autologging for experiment tracking powered by MLflow, a central feature store to organize feature tables for machine learning, push-button model serving, and a centralized model registry for machine learning operations. By including all of these features in a single platform, Databricks Machine Learning helps data teams solve the world's toughest problems by simplifying each step of the machine learning workflow. This includes machine learning operations problems that have proved to be challenging to solve. And accessing all of this functionality has never been easier. Using a user interface designed for the machine learning workflow, Databricks Machine Learning puts the Databricks platform's machine learning focused features front and center. Practitioners will continue to be able to use the notebooks they know and love, but the whole experience will be more heavily focused on machine learning. Finally, before moving into a customer use case on Databricks, it's important to stress that all of these capabilities are accessed in the Lakehouse platform. That means that as you and your colleagues use the different tools found within Databricks, you can also share all the assets you create. All right, now we'll take a 15 minute break.
All right, let's look at a customer success story. We'll start off by looking at H&M. H&M is a huge innovator in the fashion and retail industry. They rely on data as the core for everything they do, and they have stores opening up globally at a very rapid pace. H&M needed to improve their supply chain and forecasting operations to streamline their costs and maximize their revenue. They were working with an on-premise Hadoop, and that older system was really crippling their ability to ingest and analyze data being generated by millions of customers. They needed that data to power their productive machine learning models, and we're talking massive volumes of data from over 5,000 stores in over 70 markets with millions of customers, and that's every single day. H&M wanted to find a better way to make use of all that data. That legacy Hadoop-based architecture was just not sufficient for that. They simply weren't able to scale to meet their business requirements. So at H&M, data engineering was challenged because they had a fixed number of computing resources they could use, and they had a complex infrastructure, which was really resource intensive. It was costly to scale, and they suffered from some data security issues. Data sources were siloed, and that impacted the data science team's productivity. Because of all this, it would sometimes take the data science team a whole year to go from model ideation to production realization. Databricks was able to address all these challenges right out of the box. The Lakehouse platform, as we mentioned, is a fully managed plan. It's simplified managing those compute resources. It's simplified infrastructure management and operations at scale. And this collaborative notebook environment, because it supports multiple languages, meant that a diverse team of users could work together in their preferred language, which meant there was a unification across the team environment to fuel productivity. Now you can have the data science teams working with their data engineering teams, all working in their preferred language and all working in one place. When H&M moved over to Databricks, it improved their operational efficiency. It actually reduced their operational costs by about 70%. The Lakehouse platform dramatically reduced the number of components needed for data scientists and engineers to work together and overall, this had a huge business impact with faster time to insight. So they had this ability to be more granular in their decision making. Regeneron's mission is to tap into the power of genomic data to bring new medicines to patients in need. However, with poor processing performance and scalability limitations, their data teams could not analyze petabytes of genomic and clinical data. Databricks now empowers them to quickly analyze entire genomic data sets quickly to accelerate the discovery of new therapeutics. More than 95% of all experimental medicines that are currently in the drug development pipeline are expected to fail. To improve these efforts, the Regeneron Genetics Center actually built one of the most comprehensive genetics databases by pairing the sequenced exomes and electronic health records of more than 400,000 people. However, they faced numerous challenges analyzing this massive set of data. Genomic and clinical data is highly decentralized, making it very difficult to analyze and train models against their entire 10 terabyte data set. It was difficult and costly to scale their legacy architecture to support analytics on over 80 billion data points. And data teams were spending days just trying to prepare the data so that it can be used for analytics. Regeneron chose to use Databricks to simplify operations and accelerate drug discovery through greatly improved data science productivity. Despite being in a very different industry, Regeneron was able to take advantage of automated cluster management, which simplifies the provisioning of clusters, reducing time spent on DevOps work so engineers and data scientists can spend more time on research. They also used interactive workspaces, allowing data scientists to share data and insights, fostering an environment of transparency and collaboration across the entire drug development lifecycle. 
and performance spark-powered pipelines, significantly improved reliability and speed of ETL pipelines used to process their 10 terabytes of data. Let's look at some concrete outcomes Regeneron got from using Databricks. Accelerated drug target identification, reducing the time it takes data scientists and computational biologists to run queries on their entire data set from 30 minutes down to 3 seconds, a 600 times improvement. Increased productivity through improved collaboration, automated DevOps, and accelerated pipelines with ETL in two days versus three weeks have enabled their teams to support a broader range of studies. Finally, we're going to talk about Comcast. Comcast was working on a voice remote where customers could ask their remote for personalized programming recommendations. As you can imagine, that amasses a huge amount of data. The remote is designed to instantly answer a customer's voice requests. It has to turn billions of individual interactions into actionable insights. This strained Comcast's IT infrastructure and their data analytics and data science teams. On top of that, Comcast needed to deploy models to a disparate range of environments. They had cloud, they had on-premise environments, and even directly to devices in some instances. So they had some very specific challenges with billions of events generated by their entertainment system with 20 plus million voice remotes generating petabytes of data that needed to be analyzed, and they had poor collaboration. It was often difficult to share and reuse code, which added overhead and time to development efforts and the management of machine learning models. They were developing, training, and deploying hundreds of models very manually. It was very slow and difficult to replicate, which made it extremely difficult to scale those models to millions of customers. Then Comcast moved to Databricks. As I mentioned before, with the Databricks Lakehouse platform, you have an automated infrastructure, and Delta Lake made it possible to create these more robust and faster data pipelines. With Databricks, Comcast built out these rich data sets to optimize their machine learning at scale and streamline their workflows across their teams. This improved collaboration, reduced the complexity of their infrastructure, and helped deliver this awesome experience to their customers. Delta Lake enabled them to optimize files, which made for much faster and reliable ingestion of those files at scale. Looking at the numbers with Databricks, Comcast reduced their compute costs by about 10 times, and Delta Lake enabled Comcast to optimize their data ingestion. It replaced 640 machines with 64, and at the same time, it improved performance. This means that team members spend more time on analytics and less time on managing all the infrastructure they were using prior to their move to Databricks it would take approximately five full-time DevOps employees to onboard 200 users, and that dropped down from five to 0.5. Delta Lake also enabled the data team to use data at any point within the data pipeline created by data engineers, which allowed them to act more quickly when it came to building and training models, which made it faster to deploy those models. So deployment times for models went from weeks to minutes. And with that, we've come to the end of the session. We'll leave you with this. Today, more than 5 billion customers interact with data every day. By 2025, that number will be 6 billion, or 75% of the world's population. By 2022, more than half of major new business systems will incorporate continuous intelligence that uses real-time context data to improve decisions. Today, while the promise of big data and AI has never been more achievable, putting it into practice has never been more challenging. The success of your organization's analytics process hinges on knowing the challenges that lay ahead, avoiding common pitfalls, and using the right technologies that can scale with your business. We'd love to help you. We have a few next steps for you. First, if you want a free personalized consultation for how Databricks can help your organization's analytics processes, please reach out to value at databricks.com. 
Two, if you're curious about how Databricks has helped other organizations like yours, please visit the customer success story gallery at databricks.com slash customers. And three, to continue learning with the Databricks Academy, please see other resources, including self-paced online sessions and other instructor-led offerings at academy.databricks.com. If you have any questions about this session, please feel free to email me at david.harris at databricks.com. With that, stay healthy, stay safe, and please let us know if you have any additional questions that we can help you with. Thank you so much.